talk in person. This is the first in-person talk I have given since the pandemic. So we'll see how it goes. Um, and I have way too many slides and, um, I'm, and it can be broken. The talk can be ended at many different points. And so I'm happy to end it whenever. And so we can go as fast or as slow as people want. And I would say that I will say that I'm happy to have questions, but I know that whether I'm happy or not is the question. So. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so cytoskeletal image adaptation metabolism. All right, so um, like I said, there's kind of like at least like two main parts, which I'll talk about in the cytoskeletal in vitro. And um, if there's time, I'll talk about uh, work in vivo as well. And if you have much time, I'll, I'll talk about more or less of the in vivo work. Um, Okay, so for me, uh, uh, the thing which I'm like most fascinated by is biological self-organization. So um, I want to have a quantitative understanding of biological processes and of how molecules uh, self-organize into subcellular structures and cells, how cells self-organize into tissues and organisms, and how um, all of these are processes are perturbed in disease and change over evolution. So. That's that's uh, what I'm interested in. Just that, you know. Um, <laughs> How many like that? <laughs> um, and so, obviously, these are really complicated questions, and there's many, many ways of approaching them. Um, uh, the, the approach which we use in my group is to try to gain insight into these issues by doing quantitative experiments that are a form that can be uh, combined or compared with theory and simulations. All right. Um, so, so my group, there's uh, uh, basically kind of like three parts of my group. Oh, no. I don't know if there's somebody to get rid of this. Bottom, I don't think anybody get rid of it, or maybe to the side. Yeah. All right. Um, we'll see how it goes. And this will be covering people's names, which will also be bad. Um, I'll put it up here for now. All right. Okay. So. Um, can't really read people's name, but anyway, so <laughs> okay, so my group has basically three three main themes. Um, uh, there's uh, cell division is one of the main things we work on, um, and then uh, lately we've been doing stuff on uh, uh, energy and energetics, and then finally uh, work on uh, early embryo development, and and uh, all of these uh, things are combined, um, and 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 the kind of interaction between all of them. All right, so so um, so cell division. For people who aren't familiar with it, so this is um, you know, cells can divide into two. That's cell division. <laughs> now you know. <laughs> um, uh, so so when this happens, it's important that, uh, that the daughter cells uh, get you know a complete copy of the uh, chromosomes, and so the chromosomes are segregated into daughter cells, and that's done by a self-organizing subcellular structure called the spindle. Uh, the spindle assembles, aligns chromosomes, and then segregates chromosomes, uh, and then disassembles. So it's a, it's a very dynamic structure. Um, all right, so, so uh, the spindle is a you know, kind of like poster child of biological self-organization, but you know, it happens in many, many different ways and at many different levels. And uh, in my mind, I believe that uh, active matter, which this whole seminar, you know, I guess, series is on, is basically the, the way I think about it is active matter is a physics of biological self-organization, at least from that's 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 my perspective on it. So Dan, does uh, you know if the spindle helps actively segregate other things besides chromosomes? You can imagine ribosomes would all stick to the spindle, and then you get a 50-50 partition automatically around them, hoping that the more of our numbers of people. Right. Uh, and so, and so, and so um, I believe like um, uh, centrioles are, are like an example of that. Um, okay. Yeah, so centrioles are important subcellular structures that, that sit at the end of, of uh, the poles of the spindle. And um, uh, I could say why, uh, but you know, maybe it's a longer conversation, but I think they're, they're basically there in order to be accurately segregated. That, that's, that's my take on it. There's so few of them that it would be a disaster. Thank you. Yes, yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Um, but 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 most other but, but many other structures, uh, you know, of course, just uh, are randomly partitioned or, or have other mechanisms. All right. So so 
Um, so I guess this whole seminar series is on active matter, but I'll just get to give my like two second, you know, take on it. All right. Um, so like I said, the physics of biological self organization. Um, so of course there. Uh, in active matter systems are out of equilibrium, but of course there are many ways that systems can be out of equilibrium. I'll just mention um, uh, a few of them. So, so one way to be out of equilibrium is that you can imagine preparing a system in a certain state and then like letting it go. And then over time, it'll be like maybe uh, uh, relaxing without any energy input, but that relaxation will be a non-equilibrium process. You can also imagine, um, there are many samples, we have energy being input uh, kind of macroscopically at, 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 at boundaries. So maybe you have some fluid, which are heating on the bottom and cooling on the top. And that's, and that's also some, you can get some very interesting non-equilibrium steady states. But active matter is different from both of those. In active matter, uh, energy is being input at the most microscopic scales. And so the actual kind of constituent, you know, like particles um, are transducing energy themselves and they're, um, and they're individually kind of like can uh, violate detailed balance. All right, so um, nearly all cell biological structures and processes are, are examples of active matter, um, uh, you know, viewed from that perspective. Um, and in particular, the cytoskeleton um, is active matter. So um, one, one way that uh, happens is that you have molecular motors which hydrolyze the ATP and they, uh, and they um, and by hydrolyzing the ATP, they're able to walk on microtubules and exert forces on them. So you can have molecular motors, which can, for example, slide two microtubules apart from each other. And then if you have a collection of these guys, then you can get very interesting uh, behaviors. So um, you can have active matter in vivo. So um, again, the spindle is, is my personal favorite example. Uh, of this, and, and the spindle is largely composed of microtubules, molecular motors, and other associated proteins. And you can have active and you can have active matter in vitro. And so this is a beautiful sample from Zonmir Dojic's lab, where they've uh, taken purified microtubules and molecular motors and mixed them up, and they see kind of beautiful uh, circulating patterns. Uh, and in my own group, actually, we mostly do stuff in vivo. But, but we've also uh, do some amount of work in vitro. And I mean, we and, and many other people have, have you know, largely focused on understanding the mechanics and dynamics of these type of systems. And uh, that's obviously very interesting and important, um, but it's also really interesting and important to think about the thermodynamic flows of energy that ultimately drive all these non-equilibrium behaviors. So Dan, before you tell us about the thermodynamic flows of energy, can you just remind me, and the spindles on the left have these red things, those are the chromosomes? Yes. And, and it's just a subset of the chromosomes that are um, staying, they're, oh, they're fluorescent. Yeah. Okay, and so, so in this particular movie, uh, um, um, all the chromosomes are labeled. Okay. So in this movie, uh, just repeating the question, so the red. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah, oh, yeah, sorry, sorry. So the question was, uh, what's going on here? And um, uh, the, the green in this movie are microtubules and the, and the red are chromosomes. And they divided already in the movie? I uh, know, no. So this is just showing the assembly of the spindle and then some kind of slight uh, in, I mean, a little bit of motion of the spindle as well. In this mass of Thank you. Them and divide them. Second, please. Oh, I'm just trying to just repeat. Oh, 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 sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I'll try to be better. It's hard. So. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so so let's think a little bit about those kind of energy flows and stuff like that. All right, so so imagine you have some microtubules with their motors. Um, uh, like I said, so so these guys use ATP. They hydrolyze ATP to ADP, and that involves um, you know, and that allows them to you know uh, exert forces on microtubules and move them around. If that's all you you happen, if that's all that was happening very rapidly, all the ATP in your system or a cell would get used up and be converted to ADP and everything would stop. Um, so in vitro, what one often does is one couples this reaction to another chemical reaction. So for example, there's a compound called PEP, which if you put in certain enzymes, can, can convert PEP to pyruvate and then turn ADP to ATP. So if you have this going on, then, then basically, you know, your, your system will be doing this thing. Um, 
And as you're converting the heat to ADP, you'll always be converting it back until you, of course, eventually you're going to run out of PEP, in which case the, the whole system will, will uh, die. Um, but, but in the meantime, you, you can kind of do stuff with a lot of ATP around, and that can happen a lot. Uh, in each other, then you can get the cell organization, you know, maintained for actually in von Mir's lab, they can get that for many, many hours, I think perhaps even days. So, yeah, can you remind me of uh, the test uh, going to Peru, they uh, charging up the uh, ATP, ADP, is ATP. Does that typically happen? You know, memory to happen, or that's just uh, no, no. So, this, in this case, this is all soluble. Awesome. And you need special salt concentration stuff? Yes. Yes. Is it reversible? I said it, it keeps the HP at a steady level. So, a second. Does it keep the at a steady level by virtue yeah. of its reversibility? Uh, so, it keeps the at a steady level, but the fact that because this is really the rate limiting reaction. Okay. And so, in some practice, you're going to at a steady level for very long period of time. Very, very low. Age. The question was, was it reversible? Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I'm smiling. <laughs> okay, so that's for these in vitro systems. In vivo, um, you use a different reaction. Uh, you can see, okay, it's the oxidation of, of actually pyruvate in many systems, um, um, uh, which, which uh, you know, drives this other half of, uh, of this reaction. Um, and that's done. Uh, by mitochondria. So this is what people call oxidative phosphorylation. So you use oxygen, uh, oxidative to, um, you know, I guess phosphorylate ADP if to make ADP. Right. So in mouse oocytes, which if I get to the second part of the talk, <laughs> I'll talk about, um, uh, basically all of the energy, that all the ADP from mouse, nearly all the ADP from mouse oocytes, is, is, is given by oxidative phosphorylation of mitochondria. There are other pathways in cells that can also generate ATP, and so that they don't play much of a role in mouse cells. All right, okay, so then this is, if you will, like this is kind of like energy transduction, and then you can get um, like the behaviors and cool stuff. All right. Okay, so so then I think like trying to understand kind of the non-equilibrium thermodynamics of these active matter systems, I think is very, very interesting and, and I would argue important. Um, so for me personally, I have multiple motivations. One is is I think it's cool. Um, and it's just like I want to have a fundamental understanding of both active matter and cell biology. Another motivation though is that actually many diseases are caused by perturbed energy metabolism. And it's believed that's, that, that that many diseases do that and that results in kind of cell biological defects, right? And how that happens is actually very, very poorly understood. Uh, in particular, like, like in, in my own group, uh, uh, a lot of people in reproductive, one of them which we're uh, doing a lot of work on is that, so a lot of people in reproductive biology in particular, but also in other areas have, have hypothesized that defects in mitochondria can actually lead to chromosome segregation errors. Um, and so, you know, we can do a bunch of stuff looking into that. All right, and so, and so there, I think there are many, many, many questions related to these issues. I'll just kind of throw up some of them. One is kind of about energy consumption. You know, how much energy is actually used by the cytoskeletal? Or, you know, how much energy does it take to build a spindle? You know, we don't know the answer to that. Um, and, how much, and, and how much energy is used on particular behaviors, you know, signaling versus physical, you know, assembly, or all this other stuff. Um, another set of questions about what is the possible impact of varying energetic fluxes? So how does varying energy metabolism or thermonic fluxes impact cytoskeletal self-organization or the spindle self-organization? So both of those sets of questions I think are really, really interesting. And so we're trying to work on that. Or we are we are working on that. <laughs> we're trying to learn something by working on that, I guess. Um, okay, and so... Um, uh, Okay, and, and so just to give a hint that, that uh, you know, there's something here, perturbing mitochondrial metabolism actually impacts spindle self-assembly. Um, and here's, um, so uh, this is actually like an experiment with uh, two postdocs in the lab did, uh, Jingbo and uh, uh, Colm. Uh, and so mitochondria, you know, they undergo, they do oxidative phosphorylation that requires oxygen. Um, what they did is that they took a mouse oocyte and dropped oxygen levels, and then they saw the spindle disassembles, but when they raise oxygen levels, it reassembles. Right. Yeah. Are they 
Yeah, and so, and so, and so this is in vivo. This this is yeah. definitely based on membranes. Um, well, the in vitro one uh, uh, wasn't. Okay, so, so oh, yes. Yeah. Uh, uh, no, no. So I, I, uh, it's a good question. I should have a. I'm, I, I think this whole movie is roughly half an hour. The question was, how long is this movie? <laughs> how, how, how in practice do you remove the oxygen? Uh, it's sucked up by some chemical. Uh, and so, so, so you're just flowing in gases, and so that you just flow in gas without without oxygen. Basically. Thank you. You remove oxygen by flowing. <laughs> Gases without oxygen. <laughs> okay, so so you know, this is interesting. Um, or I think it's interesting. We the, the mechanism is unclear, um, and uh, I would argue that to understand this, and also the, the larger question about is there a connection in reality between perturbations of mitochondrial metabolism and uh, the spindle? Um, the way that I'm interested in asking this question, I guess, is to try to obtain a quantitative understanding of mitochondrial metabolism and try to uh, make uh, obtain a quantitative understanding of cytoskeletal slash spindle bioenergetics and then see how they're connected and then you know try to go after it that way. And you label here the tubulin. That's right. That's right. You're just and tubulin, tubulin binds to GTP, right? Uh, so it binds GTP and GDP both. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And similar things happen in plants and are chloroplasts playing role problems or not? So, so it's certainly true that this phenomena of spindles disassembling when you remove oxygen is not universal. That's definitely true that it's not universal. Um, uh, but apparently, but it happens in mouse oocytes, um, and uh, I would suspect human oocytes. So we haven't done that experiment. Yet. Yeah, so, um, when you remove oxygen from the cell, you could theoretically be perturbing the redox potential of the cell. And can you rule out that it's not like an effect on like health like bonds and the protein or something like that? Yeah, so, so this is a very like coarse perturbation. Okay, the question was um, when we're doing oxygen, when we're removing oxygen, many, many things could be going on. Oxygen does a lot of things. And, and I said a, a report, the mechanism here is totally unclear. Okay. Uh, there could be many, many things. This is just showing you that there's something interesting happening, perhaps. It's interesting, of course, that it's reversible. Um, at very rapid time scales, but nonetheless, uh, the mechanism is totally unclear. Um, and but we, we want to do more work on it. Yeah, what do you think? It's it's getting less there, and uh, I think, um, yeah, you're saying it's reversible. How did it know what cycle was originally? And would that be something that stays the same number? Well, so, so the spindle, okay, the question was how does the spindle kind of like uh, come back to how it was before? The spindle is a self organized structure. And so there's a, the question of what determines the size of the spindle is a very, very interesting question. And we, uh, we and others have to work on that. There's no like template there. It's rather that it self organizes to be that size. So it's kind of like an intrinsic thing, not based on any kind of template. But then makes it the same as the like Exactly. It says it stores it to this size. Exactly. Exactly. Can you say a bit about the exception when this doesn't happen? Oh, 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 I mean, like, um, the question is when this doesn't happen. When this doesn't happen. Um, uh, yeah, so it's certainly true that you can grow um, cancer cells, for example, um, at very low oxygen um, and, and, they, and they can divide okay. Um, uh, I don't know if it's, you know, as low as we go here. Um, uh, and, and, and I mean, there are anaerobic organisms, definitely. There are anaerobic eukaryotes. Um, and so, certainly, in that case, it's not happening. Yeah. Then, can you rescue this by adding ATP? Well, yeah. So, 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 so we have not done experiments like that, but, but, but that's definitely like a, it would be an interesting way to go. Of course, directly adding ATP would just get used up so quickly that that would probably be a little bit difficult to do. But one could imagine doing some version of that, like, which would be really, really, really interesting, but we haven't done that yet. Um, so I'm just going to leave this to the side. This is kind of motivational. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I'm happy with all these to talk about motivation. <laughs> um, okay. 
oh no, we're not going to actually start talking about the first topic. <laughs> too bad, too bad that we actually made this. Okay, uh, so an adjustment says falsity is true. Um, all right, okay, so 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 this work is all um, uh, that I'll tell you about is, is based on um, uh, the following that, that, that Yost, oh, you see, so this is like hiding people's hands. Um, Yost group developed, um, um, uh, Yost uh, originally, uh, uh, Jim Key, who was a postdoc in this lab, who's now a professor at UCSB and had a lot of drama on this work on this, uh, developed this really amazing uh, picowatt resolution calorimeter. Um, so they can do a phenomenal job of uh, measuring heat output of stuff. Um, and uh, and uh, yeah, this has actually many, many applications. I think those really interesting, exciting applications for it in a more in vivo context, because it's actually sensitive enough that one should be able to measure heat output of individual embryos, or perhaps even individual tissue culture cells. But right now I'm gonna just talk about uh, applying this, this uh, uh, instrument that they developed for looking at an in vitro sample of microtubules and molecular numbers. I'm gonna try to learn something from that. And um, the, that side of things was done by, was done by Peter Foster and uh, Beth uh, Letterman, both of whom were graduate students in my group. Peter is now a physics of living systems fellow at MIT, and Beth is now a postdoc at Princeton. Uh, but in terms of they did were as follows, is that, so they, they took basically a droplet of uh, Swadimir Dojic's magic active matter mix. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, and, and, um, and so, so this, this droplet um, it is actually not, uh, it's not an image of the droplet on the calorimeter itself, but this droplet is the same size as the ones which go in the, the calorimeter. Um, and, and if you just take this, okay, so this, this in here, we have microtubules, which are short, they're on a micron long, you can see the 75 micron scale bar here, and there are molecular motors and um, uh, depletant and, and salts and ATP and stuff. And then they, um, if you just kind of let that go, um, it, it does all these like crazy, crazy flows. Very, very interesting flows, which, um, you know, people have done a lot of studying. Um, all right, so now we're gonna ask, you know, can we understand, can we look at like the energetics of, of, of this system? Good question for you, Yes, Can you say a bit more about how you come up with words or works? Yes. And how do you calibrate it to the people? How do you get that? Yeah, okay, so the gist of it is that it's the Seebach effect, which is the, I can only remember it as the, the opposite of the Pelvier effect. Um, um, but basically, like, you know, if you have two samples, which are at different temperatures, you're going to have kind of a uh, voltage or current between them, which you can measure. And, and, then, um, and then by like, um, uh, putting in like uh, known amounts of heat, then then you can calibrate it essentially, um, and then and so basically what you're doing is you're measuring the difference, uh, in, you know, between uh, a sample and references. And so, for example, a sample with microtubules and molecular motors with ATP and ones without ATP, for example. But the references of this diagram are. Some like piece of diamond or sapphire, or all have to be uh, I, mean, I mean, like, you know, you basically want something which is kind of as close to your sample as possible, okay. but, but, but that's missing the energy. Yeah, yeah. And so, is this actually can be interpreted as a specific heat measurement, or is it just a, it's a heat flow? Well, and so, and so, and so, because if you kind of calibrate it, and okay, you always have energy being. Um, uh, you know, kind of going yeah, out yeah, yeah, yeah. right? Then, then you can actually kind of power it and really get like the power output basically directly. Yeah. The power being output from the sample. Yeah, there's only as a biologic feedback. Well, yeah. Well, I mean, so the theory of fact is really like what's going on here, and there's right, kind of a yeah, difference between the outputs. Yeah, and then the reason there are these different samples, or sorry, different references, is this was kind of a great design that they came up with. Because because this is so sensitive. Um, you know, it's really easy to have readings from all sorts of things. But then if you take, for example, 
the, 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 the difference between these two and the differences between these two, then you can kind of correct for potential gradients in your, in your sample and then you can you know, uh, do, do better. So it's a really fantastic design and it's a really fantastic instrument. So then in principle, you want one above and one below if you could? Yes. <laughs> yeah. If you're sitting in the hand, maybe you could have a little bit. <laughs> Okay, so so all right, so so then Bez and Peter put the sample on and they see total power output of 10 nanoliters. All right, so we're all done. No. <laughs> okay, so 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 what's that? All right, so how so, oh, sorry, a second? That's quite a bit compared to your resolution. Yeah, yeah, well, yeah, so I mean, this is a couple, yeah, so it's yeah, that's so good. Um, and so then the question is, um, okay, can we interpret this? You know, you know, what does this mean? Okay, so one thing you can ask is. How much dissipation comes from this beautiful large scale motions that we can see? All right, so 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 you can do uh, so. So what uh, Peter Best did is they did the uh, PIV to to you know like you know measure these flows, and they can measure the velocity of these flows. They can measure kind of correlation length for these flows. Ends up that Zvonimir, along with Dan Blair, um, uh, did uh, uh, you know actually did. Um, on that. Uh, Rihanna, yeah, on the sample, and they basically have the uh, viscosity of water, and also we know the sample size, and so we can, you know, kind of measure all that, and then you can just say, okay, like let's just do kind of basically a back of the envelope calculation, where we say that the, vis the viscous dissipation per unit volume is given by the following, which is is roughly the the, the dissipation per unit volume is roughly. The viscosity times the uh, velocity squared divided by the weight scale of the flow squared, and um, and and you know, and then we times it, multiply that by the by the volume of the sample, and we get that we expect roughly ten to the minus seven nanowatts to be being dissipated by, wow. <laughs> by those large scale motions. Wow! <laughs> How deep is your chain? Um, so the, could you clarify the question? So, so you had a this like you had a sort of hot view on what the Oh yeah, and so so roughly, so the, so the question was about what's the geometry of the sample? Yeah, so you can think of it; it's basically like kind of a half circle. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And there's another question from the Zoom audience. Uh, what do you mean by length scale of flow? Um, and so basically, just the correlate. So like. Uh, so the so the essentially like the the essentially like like the the oh, this is crappy on the screen but basically like uh, you know like uh, how much further is the flow you know you know what's the length scale that we should have like kind of swirls basically in the flow field because the point is it's like you know like what this dissipation is kind of the shearing of the fluid right and so and so then um, that gives you a sense of how much the fluid is being sheared. So you're saying this is a hemispherical droplet, so we don't have to worry about the thinness of the third dimension. That's right. That's right. It's yeah. Yeah. yeah, that's right. Good. For turbulence, what would you get for something like this? Just normal turbulence, what would you get? Would you expect this to be how is the energy dispersed across the different scales? Well, uh, okay, so so normal turbulence is 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 is, 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 is of course quite different because in, in, in normal turbulence you have energy being inputted at some large scale, which is then kind of being dissipated down, you know, as you kind of go smaller and smaller. Yeah, Here you have energy. Basically, second. Then you expect to be to your total class if you do this estimate and measure. Oh, oh, oh! If you literally did this. Yeah, yeah like, like let's say you measure this setup. Then oh. Normal turbulence, you expect it to be comparable, I guess. I, I, okay, I, I haven't thought about. Okay, the question is if, if you did a calculation like this for normal turbulence, would you get these things are comparable? Intuitively, I would guess so, but I haven't thought much about that, so, so I'm not I'm not sure. In that case, is there any local dissipation? I in just like turbulence, sure, I would sure. expect this is the only dissipation like this. So, so good. In turbulence, you would expect this to be the only dissipation. Well, it's a matter of scale. So you go to the smaller and smaller scale, there's a whole you know cascade, right? But, so my question is, what would you expect to get there? Okay, and here you have a single like scale. Well, I, I would say maybe it's as Dan is suggesting. I think it's the inverse cascade because you're stirring at very small scales and you don't sample size. Yes. And sometimes in turbulence, especially here, you can go outward with your energy 
Yeah, so definitely a lot of people kind of focus on this, what people call like low Reynolds number for true fillets, these kind of active matter, uh, the, a lot of people don't work on that. Um, and that was a lot of their stuff. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Say again? Yeah, it is. Yeah, 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 it actually is. Uh, it's just that, um, that the, very the screen is, yeah. yeah. It looks good on your screen. It looks yeah. great on my screen. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Maybe you need to work on the projector. Yeah. So I, I have another question. Yeah. Uh, because one thing would be minus two. Right? Yeah. Uh, when when Dan and John met the the geology measurement, they also show that it essentially feels stress that there's um and how it was possible. So is that relevant? So so we have a real expert here. Uh, uh, and so, and so, and so, and so, like, uh, when they do the rheology, so, so the question was about, uh, ask more about the rheology, which uh, Savannah Mir and um, uh, Dan Blair have done on these systems. Um, so, so, like, uh, if, there's a very interesting story there, which is, you know, how there's all sorts of interesting, you know, kind of subtleties and complications. Here, um, we're taking the number for the day, uh, the information they got. For high EPP levels, which is where we're at, and long time scales, which is kind of what's relevant for this type of stuff. But, but there's definitely just some subtleties there. So, on that note, without ATP, the viscosity would be perhaps much higher? Um, yes, I believe so. And, and um, yes, you know, because it would just be such a cross on microtubule network, um, it would be a viscoelastic thing. And again, I think uh, uh, Zonami, I believe Zonami and Dan looked at that as well, but I don't recall the details of what they saw. Okay, so 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 then basically the the um, you know, the, the, the power going to these large scale flows the total is really 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 small. Um, so uh, that's true. Um, okay, so 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 what's going on is the question. Um, okay, so all right, so you can imagine many reasons why this kind of efficiency could be so low. The first thing that we thought about is that maybe you have all sorts of non cross linking motors here. So, for example, um, you know, like if you have imagine you know, this little motor over here, that guy uh, can walk on a microtubule and use ATP. Um, oh, yeah, but sorry, the important thing I didn't mention is that, is that the motors only use ATP when they walk on microtubules. All right, so, so the motor that's floating in solution is basically not hydrolyzing ATP, but this guy over here. Well, hydrolyzed ATP wobble on a microtubule, but it's not going to be sliding microtubules relative to each other. So maybe a lot of the dissipation is from kind of motors like that. Um, okay, so but then so then uh, we can actually do an experiment to test that. And the reason we can do that is because Pooja, uh, who was a graduate student in Svanamir's lab, developed a really great system where what she did was uh, she did the following. So she takes tubulin. And then puts the, or takes microtubules and makes microtubules with a little tag on them, which is called, uh, you know, BG. And then she can attach motors uh, basically um, to these tag this way. And so, and so here you have you know motors attached to microtubules with a snap tag. In which case, if you have a motor over here that's kind of not crossing a microtubule, it's not going to hydrolyze ATP. Because it won't be walking anymore. So in this system, basically, you only have the only motors which are going to hydrolyze ATP are going to be the ones that are cross-linking, kind of productively cross-linking microtubules and sliding them relative to each other. All right, I just saw there's another question from the Zimana. Should the viscosity be larger than the viscosity of water? Uh, it's it's a, it's a, this is uh, okay, uh, but like the, the, the number which we used in this calculation was from an, an empirical measurement of the viscosity of these systems. And so evidently at these time scales, kind of you know, with this stuff, the, the viscosity is very close to water. Is it so just to you know add to that is it fair to say that a lot of uh, work is being done just to diminish the viscosity effectively? Uh, that's a very interesting question and, and, and I'll, I'll we have kind of a back of the envelope estimate of what we think is going on, yeah. um, uh, but it's just kind of an, an argument, and and when you hold off, and, and you'll see our argument, and then and then yeah, okay, that's yeah. good. Then can I ask another question? So yeah. you, 
and to try to keep track of all the economics of where the energy is going. So you yes. have ATP. Yes. ATP uh, gets hydrolyzed. When a molecule of ATP gets hydrolyzed, there's a certain amount of energy that gets released. Yes. Uh, and that energy could go into kind of making this flow, uh, or it could go into let's say unbinding the trailing leg of the motor, something really microscopic. That, yes. Right. So when you say efficiency, you really are talking about your calorimetry measurement versus microscopic flows right now. But the efficiency of ATP hydrolysis that goes into, let's say, unbinding the motor could be almost 100%. I don't know what it is. That's not, that's not completely correct. That's exactly right. And so it's so literally, and so because, I mean, you know, uh, like efficiency is only like defined in terms of like what you care about basically. And so then like um, here, I'm, you know, we could not use the word efficiency and just simply ask the question, how much of the energy is being used as being, you know, kind of uh, mixed all the way up to these large scale flows that we see. Um, and then, you know, you can define that ratio to be an efficiency or, or, or you could call something else, but yeah. Yeah, yeah, and, and, and basically like this, well, okay, well, let, 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 let me come back to, to uh, this second question later on. Okay. Um, okay, so, but the question is, is that how much of this kind of dissipation, how much of the dissipation, that, how much of the inefficiency that we measured for generating large scale flows comes from these non-productive, you know, like motors? All right, so, so then um, uh, Baz and Peter, uh, you know, use this, you know, Pucha sample in, in, um, in these, in these uh, calorimeters, and, and basically the flows are very similar, and the amount of energy dissipated is very, very small. All right, so, so then these are, are sorry, those, those non-productive motors, which I mentioned before, are not uh, significantly contributing to the, to the dissipation. All right. Okay, so then, so then let's um, ask a slightly different question, which is related to some of the stuff that people are asking about, is let's just hold off thinking about, you know, why this uh, efficiency is so low and just ask, can we account for the dissipation that's occurring, the total dissipation? All right, and then Peter, uh, 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 Peter Foster did the following calculation, which was very informative. All right, so he just made a very, very simple chemical kinetic model of the uh, chemical processes which we know are happening in this system, right? That, you know, ATP is hydro being hydrolyzed by to ADP by the molecular motors, and then ADP is being turned to ADP by this ATP regeneration system. And, and so basically the, the amount of energy dissipated is uh, energy you know, dissipated per reaction times the number of reactions per second. Would you say again? Where would you? Oh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. I, I, I'm, I'm not sure if I'm going too fit, and I know this is like a theory seminar, so I hope that's an advanced theory. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right, so, um, all right, okay, so so then one can, um, oh, okay, uh, okay, basically one can just, you know, kind of uh, write this out for these reactions um, where you basically, you know, uh, you have kind of reaction rates, you have the energy release per, per uh, reaction. Um, um, and the reaction rates can be some kind of complicated functions, um, which I'm sure everyone can. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, but 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 okay. What the point is is that these are very very well studied enzymes and very very, very well studied reactions. So you can basically look up in the literature like all the parameters of this theory. Right, and you can just like you know just look it up because people have characterized all this stuff really really well. And that's what Peter did. And so all the essentially all the parameters are known for the literature. Um, okay, and then we can say, um, all right, uh, let's see if this kind of simple chemical uh, model works just by looking at how the dissipation depends on the concentration of ATP. And and um, and here, okay, so this is uh, dissipation as a function of ATP concentration. You know, we have the actual data uh, compared to, you know, this on certainly the parameters of the literature, but basically just using this incredibly simple model, you can account for all the dissipation that's going on. Right? And, and I'll note one thing, which is, I mean, the other thing which is, 
not very non trivial about this, is this model is assuming well mixed chemical reactions with nothing interacting with anything else and all that stuff works very, very, very well. So, can you just give a sense of where the irreversible terms appear in these equations? <laughs> 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 How do I think about it? I mean, yeah, uh, yeah. So, so basically, like the, the the gist of what's going on here, okay, as we can see in the terms, is that is that the speed that a motor walks depends on on, on the ATP concentration. Yeah. And and so essentially, um, the heart of the matter is, and this is what's going on here, is that as you change ATP concentration, you're changing the speeds that the motors walk, hence you're changing the rate that ATP is hydrolyzed, and that explains this. Okay, so so I, I, can I think of it very crudely as uh, Stokes drag on the legs of the motor? Well, okay, so but but so like essentially, what's determining the rate of the reaction is uh, okay. So like the it, essentially the motor based on the concentration of ATP wants to hide wants to hydrolyze ATP at a certain rate, yeah. and it will walk and it will walk at you know the, the rate associated with that kind of chemical kinetics of right. that reaction, um, and then of course it will be exerting a force having to do with what's the Stokes drag on on. But, but ultimately, the Stokes drag is happening at a molecular motor scale, driven at a rate determined, as you say, by the yes, that's correct. Yeah. Two questions. One, so there's a velocity of walking in through this model, and so and so this is the uh, the the speed that a, a motor walks on a microtubule yeah. enters this model. Okay. And second question: It seems counterintuitive the result that most motors are engaged with two microtubules, right? I would expect the majority to be just walking in. So how do you reconcile that? Like how are they so efficient in kind of cross-linking two of them? Evidently they prefer to bind to, you know, like in, in you know, yeah, I mean, you'd imagine. I mean that's certainly that there are many the things. But that's a picture. Yeah, that is a picture. And also another thing I'll note is that we haven't put any force dependence in this model here, right? And so that's also the picture that these guys must be under a very, very, very low load, right? Because this is all assuming that the guys are essentially walking well unloaded. In the x-axis of this experiment, um, are you varying the ATP concentration and also kind of scaling up the ADP to keep the ratio of it, or are you just increasing ATP? Yes, that's a fantastic question. Um, and so the question was about, I'm the, right there. <laughs> the question was about, um, are we just changing the ATP concentration, which would mean that we're changing the ATP to ADP ratio, which is what's kind of given the thermodynamic driving force. We are only changing the ATP concentration, and hence the ADP, the ADP, the, the ATP to ADP ratio is changing by quite a lot. I think it would be incredibly interesting to do this experiment in an alternative way and ask if you kind of like um, change the ATP to ADP ratio and ask how stuff has up a change. Apparently, there are ways to do that in vitro, but we have not done that. That'd be very, very interesting. So, so could, could you redesign things? Maybe this would be hopelessly difficult so that the motors are carrying, are indeed carrying loads, large vesicles or something like that, to see if that changes the, the, the result? So, so I think that would be a really interesting experiment. So the question was, can we change the experiment so the motors are under high load and see what happens? That would be a very, very interesting experiment because as far as I understand, talking to people who are kind of molecular motor experts, it's not clear when kind of a motor slows down because of load, like to what extent it's kind of like slipping or is it like, you know, is it still kind of good still total type coupling? Right. Um, um, and so that would be one way to get at that question. And I think that would be a doable experiment, but we have not done that. Single molecule biophysics people like to keep block and measure stall forces. Yes, yes. So, so, but the connection of that to the ATP hydrolysis, which is actually happening when they're applying those forces, it's very, you know, it's, as far as I understand, talking to people like that, people don't understand. Thank you. And these microtubules are stabilized? These microtubules are stabilized. Okay. Uh, can, can you use a different motor? Can you use the processor? So it'd be very, very. So the question was, can we use different motors? The answer is yes, and it'll be very, very interesting. We have not done that, and, and there's, I think, there's a lot of potential in this thing. Okay, okay. So the model agrees. This, again, this is not a fit. This is just showing, you know, based off the parameters from the literature, everything agrees. Um, okay, but what about titrating other components? Okay, um, again, so we can change the, the, the microtubule concentration, and and you know, you have more microtubules, so basically more places motors can bind. 
Um, and, and again, like I said, this stuff is really well characterized. So we can just again look at some of the literature. Again, this explains stuff very well. Yeah, that would be very interesting. And the question was about temperature dependence. We did not investigate that, but that'd be quite interesting. Because again, these reactions depend on the water. Uh, finally, um, okay, without changing motor concentration. Um, okay, so, so because this, this, this model is assuming that motors are all independent of each other, this would predict that everything should just kind of scale linearly with the uh, number of motors. And in fact, we do see that for small concentration motors, but that really breaks down for larger concentration of motors. We actually don't know what's going on there microscopically, but one could imagine that you have interesting, like, perhaps traffic jams or other things happening, which I think is really quite interesting. Um, but as of now, it's just an observation. Okay, but that suggests that with load as well, that the this space. Well, it's a really interesting question. It's like, you know, is it traffic jam? Like, is it that the guys get under load or is it just the, the kind of like, you know, they can't step anywhere, you know, because there's someone else in their way, which would perhaps but, be different from being under load. I know what's the rate is slowing down the motor. The hydrolysis rate, yes, is slowing down per motor. Okay. That's right. But again, uh, if, uh, this is basically what we know. We don't know. Yeah, that. sure. Okay. okay. Yeah, or perhaps there's some type of competing interaction between motors and stuff. All right. Okay. So, so, all right. So now, now um, I'll come to uh, our back of the envelope calculation, which says what we think is going on here. All right. So, from that picture, um, unless you're at high motor concentration, it seems like you have a bunch of unloaded motors just walking at the speed they want to walk at, basically. Um, and therefore, like, okay. So, so why do we think that these um, the system is so inefficient at generating large scale flows, I think basically there's kind of energy losses at all scales. And so here's just a very simple kind of back of the calculation. All right, so consider the scale of like an individual motor. Imagine you have an individual motor that's kind of pushing apart two microtubules, right? Um, now, uh, based on the size of the microtubules in, in, in our system, um, so we, you know, we can estimate that, that the amount of force that it would take for the motor to do that at the you know, speed that is walking in our system is about one uh, uh, femtonewton. Yeah, it's really tiny because <laughs> drag is small. <laughs> um, um, but but the stall force of motors is, is is about ten picotons. So there's a huge amount of excess there. Um, and so that tells you that kind of like the inefficiency at this level already is kind of like 10 to the minus four, you know, like just by this kind of tight coupling that you can't just use, you know, uh, one ten thousandth of an ATP to take a step, right? <laughs> you're kind of has to use one ATP for each step irrespective of how much force you're asserting. Um, okay, in our system, we estimate that there's not just one microtool per, um, oh, sorry, one motor per microtool, but on average 10 motors cross-linking, you know, kind of, or 10 motors per microtool. Um, the, because you know one motor is moving under no load, ten motors working together aren't making anyone move faster, right? They're just moving at the same rate, so that's kind of you know more wasted, um, uh, you know, energy, if you will. Yeah. Well, 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 let me just kind of say our thing, and then, then, then we can talk about other possibilities, which there are many. But this is just a very, I think this is the stupidest possibility basically right? we have right here. Uh, that gives you another factor of 10, that's 10 to the minus five. And now uh, in this system, you know, we have a bunch of bundles expanding, which are causing, which is causing fluid to move. And then you're generating all these large scale flows because of the, all this kind of fluid motion. Um, now, uh, when you think of a, a, a rod that's, if you think of a bundle as being a rod that's extending, the the um, the uh, uh, dependency of you know the, the amount of fluid that this rod moves uh, is very insensitive to the diameter of the bundle, right? Um, and to some a first approximation, you can say it basically doesn't, or some zero fold approximation, you can say it basically doesn't depend on the on the diameter of the bundle. So that was the transition. The half of the things in the bundle are pointing one way, half in the other. Yes. Getting longer and longer. Can you dissipate a significant amount of energy by having these elongated things uh, 
uh, crash into the walls. And, and, and as, as Ariel said, Ben, I mean, you're not confined to things. Yes, God. yes. And so this thing is. And so, 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 so certainly that can happen. Okay, don't forget these, these uh, microtubules are very, very short compared to the system. So they don't, very few of them get long enough to span the system. Yeah, yeah, the bundles themselves are also very, very short for the system. I mean, they can still bend and, and okay. have all sorts of flows. But if we just say that, like, you know, again, you know, like I said, that, that, that the amount of fluid that's moved is, is to some first approximation, basically doesn't even depend on the uh, bundle size. We, we estimate that there are actually about a thousand microtubules in cross section in these bundles. And just, you know, adding that already gets you to the 10 to the minus eight that we said. And so there could be a lot of other things going on. There are many other possible sources of dissipation, but I would argue these are about the stupidest things that one could think of. And already you, 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 you can get close to this 10 to the minus eight. So, I mean, again, other things certainly are happening, but that seems to capture a lot. What's the dispersion in the bundle diameter? Um, and so that's a great question. We don't have good measurements of that. We don't have good measurements. The question is, we don't have the good measurements for the diameter of the. Uh, uh, it's just we don't have good me measurements for the distribution of diameters for the bundles. So this is very much kind of a, just a, a, a very rough estimate for the bundle size. Um, okay, so then, so then. Um, <laughs> the, the, the sort of bit, the bundles are really, really bad at fluid. <laughs> Um, okay, so then in summary, um, okay, so I'll say that uh, large scale motions are in, in, in this um, active matter system, large scale motions are an extremely minor source of dissipation. Um, um, a simple chemical kinetic model, which is assumes everything is well mixed and nothing's under load, can actually do quite a good job of, of explaining the dissipation, um, um, even though uh, seeing more interesting is happening at high motor concentrations. And like I said, microtubule bundles are very, very inefficient at generating fluid flows. Um, all right, so, so one thing um, I think is really interesting to ask more generally about kind of dissipation in active matter systems, trying to understand it. One lesson, which, which I learned from, from this work, is I've definitely heard people sometimes look at cells and be like, oh, the cell is doing you know, this one mechanical thing. It takes X amount of work to do that. I estimate that it, where X is some calculated by some like kind of Stokes drag about the, you know, some object moving and, and whatever, that would assume an efficiency close to one for the, whatever motion you're looking at. At least in this in vitro system, you know, you can easily be off by, you know, a factor of 100 million. So, so you should be careful about doing such estimates uh, without thinking about really what's going on. And, and um, we're, Definitely very, very interested in understanding kind of dissipation and energy use in actual cell and uh, developmental biological systems. And we are um, doing a lot of work in that regard. And I think I will end here. So quickly to the last slide. So. Would it be of interest to have dead motors in your sample and vary the ratio of life of dead motors? Exactly, exactly. So I think stuff like that could be incredible. So the question was about varying life to dead motors and investing in that. I mean, I think that's related to what David was asking before about having kind of, um, I mean, a, a, a different way to have kind of life motors under load. I mean, I think one could imagine doing an experiment, for example, doing like a motility assay. So you have the microtubules like zooming around on the, on the surface and then you could stick in dead motors and you could see how fast they move and then you could see how energy dissipation you know depends on you know rate of motion of guys that are low you know. and so one could definitely imagine doing experiments like that it be cool to do, but. yeah the way i was coming at it was you, you know your whole calculation starts by assuming a viscosity coefficient which is the effect of long time scale yes. biology measurement right and um the motors i mean they, they're not raising the overall temperature in any meaningful way but you're still getting some effect of lower viscosity because they're somehow they're agitating in some way that's not temperature but still reduce viscosity yeah i think it's a really interesting question kind of what's the right way because it's like i mean maybe one thing that's related to is that like if you look at how these kind of active matter theories are always formulated 
the way that people kind of formulate them is that you have some essentially passive mechanical response and then some active stresses. And then what you see is like kind of, you know, the response. And of course, yeah. this is kind of true, but like, but like the passive stuff can also depend on the active things as well. And so it's actually really complicated. And I don't know, like from a microscopic perspective. Yeah, that's the basic. basic yeah, point, you know, yeah, that's kind of the right way to think about this stuff. I mean, actually, you know, like, yeah, I think in general, in all this kind of active stuff, how you go from kind of microscopic, microscopically what's happening to kind of these macro scale stuff is, is it's incredibly interesting, but that's very, very poorly understood. Yes, yeah, the hope of the test about the death models is that they, they play presumably both a structural role in the nature of your sample and and uh, this dissipative role, right? Active role. That's right, that's right, that's right. So the, yeah, exactly. So, so the, the statement was that motors play both, well, yeah, it's kind of confusing because the motors are also the cross linker, which yeah. is providing yeah. the you know, kind of passive stuff and they're active, they're the thing providing the force. So it is kind of confusing. Yeah. Yeah, like another thing which I get confused about is that like at any instant in time, I mean, the, the actual stepping time of a motor is very, very quick. So at any instant in time, it's like nearly everyone's just kind of a passive cross linker and like, you know, yeah, that is I kind of very confusing. All right, another question from the Zoom audience. How does dissipation enter the kinetical, the chemical kinetic model? Uh, and, so, and so basically like, um, there's, there's you, you, you know, the, the dissipation is essentially like the, um, you, you basically know the enthalpy of every reaction because again, these are very um, well characterized reactions. And then the chemical kinetic model tells you the rate of those reactions. And then when you know the kind of heat produced, which is really the enthalpy per reaction, um, the heat generator or whatever, um, and then times the, 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 the uh, rate of the reactions. Uh, Go ahead. Uh, this is a very open-ended question. I'm not even sure actually if it's a good question, but um, kind of from the evolutionary perspective, um, I think people in science uh, uh, sometimes say, well, the fact that cells do something, organisms do something, it must be uh, optimal uh, in some way because it evolved for so many years, right? So um, in, in this case, I mean, is it, would it be true to say that maybe that is uh, true more locally in terms of you know, optimizing mutations and sequences of specific enzymes. But when you look at the more global phenomena that really involve many components, uh, you could actually have a hugely wasteful. Well, it's so, okay. So, so the question was about kind of like optimality and, and, and evolution in relation to this type of thing. I mean, so like my personal perspective is I think a lot of things like aren't well optimized in, in cell and development biology. And I think kind of most of the stuff that cell biologists, including myself, spend the time working on kind of are basically evolutionarily not relevant <laughs> um, and really aren't the direct targets of selection. Um, um, but, but, um, um, uh, but you'd think energy consumption would always be a target of selection because if, um, some, if another organism right, is that true or not? Well, okay, so that, that's a fantastic question. And, and, and I mean, okay, so, so one thing which I think about, which I think is very interesting is that, okay, so I remember, so I, I don't know fluid mechanics, but I taught undergrad fluid mechanics. Um, <laughs> and I remember this one calculation which you do, which is like, what's the most efficient windmill that you can build, right? Because you know, because like wind is doing two things. One, you're like spinning the windmill, but you're also transporting fluid there, right? You're, you know, and so like if you actually extracted all the energy from the fluid, then you wouldn't have to be transporting any, any more wind, and the windmill would stop, right? So there's a kind of most efficient windmill you can have, right? So there, you know, the fact that uh, you have a, a physical fluid which has its own like thing like limits you know like the kind of maximum efficiency you could have because you're dealing with the fluid i wonder like are there equivalent things for stuff built up built out of micro tools and motors right so maybe this is the most efficient thing you can build out of micro tools and motors to transport fluid i don't know I mean, actually i think not but like um but 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 really there's something which is the most efficient thing you can build out of micro tools and micro motors and truly that'll be much less efficient than kind of the, the the most efficient thing, not taking you know material constraints into account. So I think that's a super interesting question, personally. In, in, in just a comment, in the early days of single molecule biophysics, people like Michael Fisher would say that these motors would be like designing an automobile in Saudi Arabia, where you know, petroleum is very efficient, and very plentiful, and so it's not the rate right limiting that possible in yeah. many situations. Yeah, and also, also actually related to both those things. I mean, again, it seems to me that like certainly, if 
if, if motors weren't tightly coupled and they could just use a fraction of an ATP molecule to get their energy, then that would be much better. Um, I mean, that's probably not physically possible, but, but it's still like, you know, there's a hypothetically imaginative as well. In the spindle, do you have similar bundles like two volts? Yeah, okay, so, so, so that's a great question about like efficiency of like spindle stuff. And so like, you know, one thing which is actually quite different and also different, okay, so muscle is actually quite efficient. Um, uh, it's a people did a lot of work on that type of, you know, that type of thing. And one thing which is really quite different about muscle compared to this is that there you have things like elastically coupled with each other. Here in this system, everything's kind of coupled through the fluid. Um, and I think that's what makes this kind of system, so one of the things that makes the system so crappy. Yeah. Um, you know, I mean, there are others as well, but like, uh, uh, yeah, I think that's a really interesting question of like how this stuff relates to the spindle. That's super interesting. Uh, another question came up from the audience. Is there any literature on Markovian modeling of non-equilibrium steady states in molecular motors and how does your work compare to that? Uh, yes, there definitely is. I mean, I mean, actually like I guess like our chemical kinetic model is about the simplest Markovian model or, you know, it's really just a kind of an individual motor, a bunch of independent motors walking on microtubes. And so, and so that's, that's, that's an example of that. Yes. Oh, oh, sorry, sorry. I, I, I thought it was clear. Uh, that, that that was based on direct measurement of the viscosity. Um, uh, and so yes, so yes, people have directly measured the viscosity in certain kind of uh, you know, the system. On the dissipating system, right? Yeah, yeah, on the dissipative system, you know, on the active system. Yeah, exactly. So why is it instead of simple viscosity? Yes. So why do you think that's the case when viscosity and cytoplasm is alive? I don't think the viscosity and cytoplasm is a term of like this model. <laughs> no, I mean, I mean, but actually, what the terms of this cost of cytoplasm isn't isn't clear. Um, uh, but you agree that so it's huge compared to what yes, 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 yes. But, but it's also a little bit of a complicated thing because that's kind of a big scale dependent thing as well. So I believe like small molecules function to to diffuse quite quickly. Uh, well, well, like larger things are much slower. So the, the, the viscosity of cytoplasm is quite complicated. It's kind of ATP there. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Yes, okay, so so like um, people have shown that if you deplete ATP of cells, then you can still down. Yes, a huge amount. Now, some people have interpreted that, that you must have active like kind of mixing. That's one possible explanation. Another possible explanation is that a lot of you know, ion homeostasis and pH homeostasis are also ATP dependent. And so you could imagine you know, that you just kind of like screw up those, which would also change viscosity. So I think the mechanism of that isn't clear, but it's, it's a very interesting one. Yes, thank you.